Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we take a look at the role of government in the First World War. We hear now from Professor Heather Jones about the monarchy. I'm Heather Jones, Associate Professor in International History at the London School of Economics, and I'm shortly to move to University College London to be Professor in Modern and Contemporary European History. I'm a specialist in First World War Studies, and at the moment I'm working on a book on the British monarchy in the First World War, looking at how the monarchy frames the understanding of the war in the UK and also across the empire. Interestingly, there is currently no academic monograph on the British monarchy in the First World War. There was a shift in the 1960s, very much doing history from below, which was excellent to look at the experience of ordinary people in the war. But the move to social and cultural history has somewhat neglected the history of elites, particularly of the monarchy. A lot of the work on monarchy stops in 1914, looks at the 19th century monarchy, Victoria, the experience of Edward VII and his diplomacy internationally. We have a gap from 1914 to 1918, and the ways that the war impacts the monarchy and its relationship with the population of the UK, and that's the gap I'm aiming to fill. At the outbreak of the First World War in August 1914, the British monarch was King George V, and the Queen was his wife, Queen Mary of Tech. They were new in this role. They were already very proficient at it. They'd done a lot of tours to the northern industrial parts of England. They'd gone out to try and meet the working class, that part of the population, which had been somewhat neglected by monarchy before this period. They were very much involved also in the political life of the country. The king had tried to resolve the constitutional crisis over home rule in Ireland through a conference at Buckingham Palace in the summer of 1914, something that had distracted British politicians from the crisis growing in Europe around the outbreak of the First World War. He'd also been involved in the constitutional crisis around the question of restricting the powers of the House of Lords. So they were not complete rookies in the job. But the war brought a whole range of challenges to monarchy and they had to adapt particularly quickly to deal with them. King George V was very different to his father, Edward VII. Edward VII had been the playboy son of Queen Victoria, rebelling against his mother, who was very strict and had a very conservative understanding of social interactions, of morality, of love. Edward VII, her son, was bohemian in character. He liked parties. He liked going to Paris. He liked spending his holidays in the south of France. He had multiple mistresses. His son, George V, the king during the war, was more similar to his grandmother. He was a devoted husband to his wife, Queen Mary, very much focused on living quietly. This was someone who liked a sober and ordinary style of living. The queen at the time of the war, Queen Mary, was someone with enormous energy who, when she took on a cause, would be very involved in developing it, in organising it. She was really a very stoic woman. Both the king and queen were very devout. They took their role as monarch very, very seriously. They saw it as a duty that they were honour bound to fulfil. They weren't very interested in luxury. They were much more focused on work. King George and Queen Mary were very fond of their children. There's a lot of evidence that they were very hands-on in trying to monitor the children's education and development. Their oldest child, who became Edward VIII, David, he was, as a young man, very close to his parents. He was very young for his age at the outbreak of the war. When he goes to the Western Front, he tries very hard to get advice from his father. He writes to his father frequently. And when his father comes to the Western Front on visits, the Prince of Wales is very keen to spend time with Papa and is very lonely and actually sad when he leaves. Now, as the war goes on, that relationship really disintegrates. And you see the Prince of Wales becoming very fond of going out and seeing the bright lights of Paris. He gets involved with prostitutes. Like many First World War officers, he seeks parties and escapism from the war because he's seeing such horrible things at the front. The second son, Albert, or Bertie as he was known, was very similar to his father, George V. He was quite shy. He didn't find it easy to socially interact and party like his brother. He was a much quieter personality. And I think in many ways the king found him easier to deal with than his older son. The royal family also had a daughter, Princess Mary. Princess Mary was, again, a very shy personality. Under the shadow of her mother, she did a lot of charitable work with her mother during the war. At the end of the war, she becomes a nurse in Great Ormond Street Hospital and nurses small children. That's part of her getting experience of the duty side of monarchy. And it's something she enjoys. 
Queen Mary is very pleased about her doing that. Her role is different to that of the two boys who enter into military service. Albert serves in the Navy. He's on board ship during the Battle of Jutland and is at risk of being sunk the same as any other sailor in that battle. Edward VIII to be serves on the Western Front, although he's meant to be safely behind the lines in a staff officer job. He has to earn the respect of the men somehow because he can't fight. And so he, he goes out looking for trouble, looking for spots where he can go and visit men under shelter. And they massively appreciate that. Princess Mary's role is much more of a charitable role, a support role to her mother. She does at the end of the war visit the Western Front, but the war is over at that point. Her main contribution that's remembered today is the Princess Mary gift box which is sent to troops as a Christmas present. It contains cigarettes and chocolates and it has her image on the front of the tin. There's many stories in the press of how it saves people's lives because the bullet hits the Princess Mary gift box in the tunic pocket. So she's seen something of an idealised figure of femininity during the war. It's very difficult to see what the real Princess Mary was actually like. The monarchy during the war functions at two levels. The symbolism of the king as a kind of eternal symbol of Britishness in the war, and then the king as a man, a human, reaching out to these other men who are fighting, who see themselves as fighting for him. When the king goes to the Western Front, both those levels collide. On the one hand, you have the king visiting his troops as a person. He wants to see how they're being treated. He wants to see how the war is being waged, to keep tabs on some of those generals and what they're doing and make sure that he is not neglecting what's going on there. The other level that's happening is this idea of the king as symbol visiting his armies, a kind of historic echo of monarchs past going to France, Agincourt, Crécy. These are discussed in the diaries of the royals. It's referred to in the press when the Prince of Wales goes abroad to the Western Front in the autumn of 1914, how this is a Prince of Wales going to France and the echoes of where that had happened in the medieval period, ironically to fight the French, but they have to try and play that down because the French are now their allies in World War I. The troops are lined up to cheer the king. And it's hard to tell whether that's a voluntary thing, the cheering, or whether they're obliged to do it. But when you look at the diaries of the men who experience this, they're very positive for the most part. They do not like having to stand out in the rain or the cold for hours on end waiting for his car to pass. But they really do appreciate him coming and coming particularly to dangerous spots. That is a sense that they haven't been forgotten and that the monarch cares about them. When he goes to inspect units or when he goes to inspect technology such as machine gun sites or heavy artillery sites, he spends a lot of time asking questions. This is very much appreciated. In 1915, famously during one of his trips to the Western Front, his horse rears while he's inspecting a group of Royal Flying Corps men and crushes him. He suffers really quite dangerous injuries and has to be evacuated by ambulance train despite being so badly wounded, insists on pinning a decoration to a soldier who was due to get that award the following day. The man is brought onto the hospital train and kneels before the king because the king cannot stand up from the stretcher. So it's this kind of story that endears the monarch to his troops. The king and country slogan is not an empty cliche about the First World War. It is for king and country. The king himself is the country they are fighting for. You can't have one without the other. One of the things about the First World War is that it involves mass mobilisation of the UK population in a way that has never happened before. Conscription is introduced in 1916. Before that, there is a huge push to try and create a mass army via voluntary recruitment. Now, that really involves a lot of campaigning, a lot of mobilising the population at an individual level in ways that hasn't happened before. The monarchy is very involved in recruitment and creating a home front that is cohesive. You cannot fight a mass war only with officers. You cannot fight a war that involves industrial mobilisation on the home front unless you can convince workers to work those extra hours to not strike. The monarchy, therefore, comes into contact with ordinary people as part of that process to a much greater extent than in previous conflicts. Visiting the factories, visiting the shipyards, shaking hands, spending time talking to people. King George liked to see people working. He wasn't keen on the idea of their visits interrupting things. The hospital visits were often at very short notice. One nurse was particularly overwhelmed by that and had to sit down in shock that the king and queen were going to arrive in 10 minutes. The king and queen had already visited the north of England and the industrial areas before the war, and they knew how successful those visits had been. So those visits are extended during the conflict, in 1917, 1918 particularly, the years when there's concern about the spread of revolution in the east of Europe and in Russia. The monarchy starts to talk about this is the people's war, this is a democratic war. The king starts to support extending the franchise. At the outbreak of the war, it wasn't one man, one vote. Voting was linked to all kinds of property-owning restrictions. There were a large number of soldiers fighting on the Western Front who couldn't actually vote. Women couldn't vote. Obviously, there's the formal side of things, the award ceremonies, the investitures at Buckingham Palace. But 
There's an awful lot more of the monarchy going out to the people, going out to the east end of London after air raids, being very present very quickly. In one case, there's a very serious air raid in June 1917. The king is there the afternoon of the raid. It happens in the morning. It was a real recognition of the fact that this was a war effort that would only be won by the whole population pulling together. There's a sense as well of past clashes or grievances being suppressed for the duration of the war. So the Irish Home Rule Movement supports the war effort. The suffragettes, there'd been a clash between them and the monarchy before the war, come on board. Queen Mary forms very unexpected friendships. She becomes a close friend of Mary MacArthur, who's a notable Scottish labour activist during the conflict, and uses these contacts to find out more about how workers live. They also use the clergy a lot to find out that type of information. The king and queen were not sheltered from the horrors of the conflict. Queen Victoria was interested in the ordinary soldier, but nothing happened under her reign to the extent we see with King George and Queen Mary, where they are going into hospital wards, arriving often very soon after people have been brought to hospital as casualties. That happened in the case of the air raids in London. On the Western Front, the king is present during the Ludendorff Offensive at a point where the British have retreated so far that their hospital system has dissolved into chaos. The original advance stations have had to move back. And so when he goes to visit a Canadian hospital, it has become a first line of medical care for men coming straight in from advanced dressing stations. He sees the men arriving. They haven't been cleaned. Their uniforms are filthy. And he is present, discreetly present. He writes in his diary about not getting in the way. There's a sense from that entry that he is trying very much not to be a formal visitor. This level of experience of hospitals and wounding, types of facial disfigurement they're seeing, the paralysed men, the types of disability they're seeing, is unprecedented for royals. And I think it does establish a trajectory of royal pastoral care for civilians and soldiers who have been badly hurt that continues after the war. It also changes the royal interaction with the disabled body. Before the war, royalty was meant to be perfect and any type of disability or illness was hidden from the public. Think of the haemophilia in Queen Victoria's line. By the end of the war, the royals are pioneering rehabilitation of disabled soldiers. They're meeting with men who've been blinded in the war. They're trying to promote these men being rehabilitated back into work with the King's Employment Scheme for Disabled Veterans. It has changed the stigma that was around disability before the war. The disabled veteran is now being honoured by the King and Queen. I think one would have to go back to the medieval period when kings were actually on the battlefield leading their forces to see a monarch who was as close to war as George V. One thing that's very difficult for us to understand today is how formal culture operated in the Edwardian period and the First World War era. These were class cultures for a start, and I don't want to negate the fact that the monarchy is at the pinnacle of a class system that's a very unjust system, but... The formality of these cultures should not mask us the fact that these people obviously felt pain and hurt and bereavement, but it's expressed in a formal way. And so we sometimes make mistake coming from our own informal culture of seeing very formal letters of condolence from the king when someone's son had died, formal handshakes rather than hugs as some kind of emotional repression. This was actually how this culture operated. And the formality itself was seen as having dignity. People didn't really want the royals throwing their arms around them, weeping on them. They wanted to see dignity being accorded because with dignity came honour. And these were honour cultures. It's Britain in the First World War was an honour culture. When you look at the scouting pledge, I promise on my honour, honour was a tangible thing. It was an asset. When a country lost its honour by not standing up for treaties it had signed, that was seen as an appalling thing. That's one of the origins of the First World War itself. When a man lost his honour, He'd lost his good name. He'd lost virtually everything in an era when references, honour and family honour were how you presented yourself to the world. So the ways in which the king and queen were interacting with veterans, with the wounded, with civilians in the workplace was one that was based around honour and dignity. They symbolise the nation. They're bringing the nation's thanks to the workers by visiting them. And that is hugely important in a conflict where people are really having to work extremely hard and doing very long hours. The munitionettes are working with dangerous chemicals. Any kind of recognition from the state is a way of avoiding war weariness, resentment, discontent arising out of the wartime working conditions. And so the monarchy is a very valuable asset in this. If one compares the British monarchy and their war effort, the amount they work, the simple living that they take on, they ration food in the palaces. The king gives up alcohol for the duration of the war at Lloyd George's urging to set an example to the workers of the UK to make sure that they will work longer hours and not arrive hungover. 
This is a massive contrast with, say, the German monarchy at war, where the crown prince is living it up just behind the Western Front. He never puts himself in danger. German soldiers come to really resent the crown prince, Willy, as he's known, for all his affairs with local women. There's one woman in a village who comes known as the crown princess because she's his mistress. He brings his wife and children to live it up in a beautiful chateau. The royals on the home front in Germany, they're not working the industrial areas in the same way that the British monarchy is. The monarchies that survived the war such as the Belgian monarchy, are the ones where the royals do actually go out on the ground. Belgian king is very visible, very much puts himself at risk, puts his wife at risk, stays near the front. It's that visibility and it's that eschewing of luxury that really matters in a conflict where the rest of the country is going through really difficult times and losing loved ones. Asquith in the House of Commons and Boner Law stand up and pay tribute to the king and queen at the end of the war and talk about how they are king and queen not by virtue of birth or heredity, but by virtue of service. And that you only become and remain a monarch by popular consent. So as long as the monarch is working hard, serving the people, then they're not actually the same kind of monarch as the ones in the continent that are getting overthrown. They're a kind of democratic monarch, even though no vote has ever been held to elect these people. There is a sense of the British monarchy is different, special. And this as being particularly British, that is a very successful PR line, if you like. Queen Mary's mother was German. She's Mary of Tech. Tech is in Germany. And she spoke with a German accent her whole life. But it is a hugely successful line that the British monarchy is somehow exceptional. And that is a World War I contribution. And it remains with us to this day. That is how they navigate the huge challenges that World War I throws up. Domestic challenges in terms of the rise of Lloyd George, who's hugely popular and there's worries about how democratic he is. The king himself has much of his political influence cut away by Lloyd George. There's also international challenges because there is the overthrowing of monarchies all across Europe where diplomacy was done often under the aegis of royal figures. That falls away by the end of the First World War. There's a sense of living in very new times with regard to the rise of socialism and completely new expectations around what people expect the state to deliver in terms of welfare and care. They have to navigate all of that. The fact that they've been visibly working hard during the war, people respect them for that. So you do get a sense the royals have really earned the fact that they are left in place It's not just because Britain wins the war, Italy wins the war. The Italian monarchy remains in place in the interwar period, but it's virtually castrated by the rise of Mussolini. He accrues all the power from the war experience, even though the Italian king had tried very much to be il re soldato and be present with the troops at the front. It's not just victory. It's about how you have managed the domestic, how you have shown the new working class that you are a monarchy for them. In 1922, after the war, King George V goes on what he describes as a personal pilgrimage to the battlefield graves. This is not a state visit. French dignitaries take part in many of the ceremonies. Ferdinand Foch, the Generalissimo, who'd won the war for the Allies, is present. But it is seen by the king and it is portrayed in the press as the monarch going to express the grief of the nation. Remember, many people were unable to travel to the graves. Many people had no known grave to travel to. The king and queen go to these battlefield cemeteries in conjunction with the Imperial War Graves Commission. They're looking at the work that's been done, and it's also a tribute to the Imperial War Graves Commission, with which the royals are very involved. But it's also a religious pilgrimage by a king describing himself as a pilgrim. The echoes are very clear here. They talk about the British monarch as a servant king. This is a religious language. This is the head of the established Church of England talking and being projected as the servant king. The servant king is Christ. The king is divinely anointed at the coronation. It's almost a priest-like role. So there are all kinds of messages being sent out to what was still a religiously literate population, even if it wasn't largely church-going in urban centres. The visit is portrayed in the press as the monarch paying homage to the men who have died for him. It's really important for the monarchy to always show that they are cognizant of the sacrifice that has been made. Otherwise, if the war is suddenly seen as futile, their role in recruitment at the start of the war, the fact that the war was waged for king and country, could actually undermine the monarchy. That never occurs in the British case because they show such reverence and recognition for the sacrifices that have been made. So if you think about the burial of the unknown soldier, the monarch is the chief mourner. He is throwing the soil down on the coffin. The king is humbling himself before this unknown figure who could be from any rank, from any part of the empire or the UK. So it's the king elevating this unknown soldier to the level of royalty. It says it on the tombstone. They buried him among the kings. It's that sense by which the casualties become the royal family's war dead and the royal family shows itself as humble before them that I think takes away a lot of that sting about the monarchy's role at the outbreak of war in being a symbol of recruitment. 
After the death of King George V, his son Edward VIII came to the throne. In 1936, Edward VIII abdicated. It was the year of three kings. George V died, Edward VIII abdicated, and his brother uh, George VI came to the throne. The abdication crisis was a result of the fact that Edward VIII wanted to marry a twice-divorced woman, Wallace Simpson, who was also American and was considered unsuitable as a future queen. The reasons, however, why the abdication crisis causes such a furore and such a trauma, which really lasts for decades in the British psyche, are very closely linked to the First World War and to these ideas of honour culture and divine monarchy. What we see from the perspective of Queen Mary, who's still alive, and many other members of the royal family, is a sense that Edward VIII is being incredibly selfish. He cannot make a minor sacrifice, a sacrifice to the woman he loved, when so many other men are no longer alive because they made the ultimate sacrifice in the First World War and died for the monarchy. They gave up so much for king and country. Why can Edward not give up a much more minor thing as the king of the nation they fought and died for? There's a real concern amongst the royals that Edward's actions will be seen as disrespectful to monarchy, to the dignity of the office, and to the sense of sacrifice that the office brings. The other key element of it is honour. The honour codes of the First World War are still there. There's a sense that a king should be doing his duty by God, who was placed in this position of becoming monarch. The coronation is a sacred religious ceremony, and Edward VIII isn't acting in keeping with any of that. By the end of the First World War, Edward VIII has become quite a traumatised war veteran. He's a weak character anyway. He's been sent on these world tours to stabilise the empire in the wake of the war, which had been away from home for a long period of time, has become quite Americanized and doesn't see any of this older version of monarchy, the wartime version of monarchy, as being of use. He wants to modernise. He sees the monarchy as being about the celebrity behaviour of the monarch rather than being about the office. It's only the king they should see, not the individual man. So there's a lot of background from the First World War hanging over the abdication crisis. And many of the figures involved lived through the war. If one looks at moments such as Edward goes on a trip in the Mediterranean with Wallace Simpson on board his yacht. During that trip, he makes an official visit to the war graves at Gallipoli. It's kept secret that she's on the yacht, but the elites know this. This is again seen as really disrespectful, not the type of thing that one does to live up to this idea of a British monarchy that during the war has become something that's seen as self-disciplined, sober. Out of the abdication crisis with George VI coming to the throne, you see a great level of continuity with George V, a monarchy of service, of consent, of duty, right through to Elizabeth II, who has lived exactly that type of monarchy, those types of values, and who was very close to her grandparents, George V and Queen Mary, and spent a lot of time with them, particularly with Queen Mary, who has a very long life. The 1936 moment is an aberration. We never go back to that type of Edward VII playboy monarch in the 20th century after Edward VIII goes. That was Professor Heather Jones on the monarchy during the First World War. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Professor Jerry Rubin about the Defence of the Realm regulations and other emergency legislation enacted during the First World War.